Hello, our friends. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm very honored to address all of you, and uh, especially honored that Mr. Sample is between us here, the revered member of the Universal House of Justice. And uh, I want to say, first of all, before getting into my points, thank Mr. Banani and uh, inform you that he himself had a major role in this project. And uh, because he acted as the electrical consultant, I see a lot of his colleagues and my colleagues in the audience. And uh, perhaps this is the place for me to thank him for what he did for his own faith, I should say, but helping me too. Mr. Sample being here uh, recalls a lot of uh, memories. This is just about 30 years that I was first called to act as the architect responsible for the seat of Universal House of Justice. And uh, one of the faces that I first met, because Mr. Semple was on the building committee from the very first day I arrived, uh, it was Mr. Semple and his kind face. And we've been dealing uh, about the affairs of the building at World Center all through these 30 years. Uh, to me, it's a very interesting uh, kind of occasion that he is here. And uh, all these memories of these 30 years comes up. Uh, the memory about the fact that when I arrived, the staff of the World Center was very, very limited. I don't remember, was it something about 20 or 30 or a little bit more? Uh, and uh, now it is something, forgive me if I'm not very exact about the numbers, but 600 or 800 now serving in the World Center. And uh, the situation was as such that when the first time I came down with the model of uh, the seat of Universal House of Justice. Uh, you just imagine who received me in the airport. It was one of the members of the House of Justice. I think it was Mr. Gibson. And uh, he came down to pick me up from the airport, helped to put these heavy models uh, in the back of his car, and we drove down. That was the situation of those days. And uh, when I was asked to address you here, I was wondering what I should say, because the memories are a lot. And uh, for, I was wondering that some people perhaps have not seen anything about these buildings. Some of you, you may have seen the buildings and have seen all these pictures now on internet. Uh, there is a lot of it that most of you have seen. I wondered what I could share. I, will, I think what I would do, I would brief you about some of my memories and the process of this design of the complex and how it came about, and then share some of these slides with you and give you some of the feelings I had when I was assigned to start work on these projects. Uh, at that time, uh, I, thought, uh, I thought I'm not very young. Those days I was just about 30. And uh, now I think I was very young. <laughs> and uh, I had done a few projects in Iran. And uh, the house, with their great kindness and compassion, they called me in to 
talk to me about the project. Uh, and in that committee, the building committee, that I found out afterwards, that was the building committee. Uh, they asked me uh, if I have uh, time to do the seat. And uh, to, <laughs> right. This is the way they act, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I have said before that, first of all, I don't know many architects that would reject any work. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, here uh, it was something that was very, what I was somehow brought up with this vision and uh, uh, a kind of aspiration about the faith and what he's going to do for the world and the teachings of Baha'u'llah and uh, the unity of mankind and his teachings like a sun that will give light to the future civilization all these were the way we were brought up with as a fourth generation Baha'i. And uh, to me, when I was uh, asked to be the architect of the seat, uh, it was something uh, on, I, I really didn't see myself worthy of doing it. <clears throat> but on the other hand, it was something that, to me, was the portal to that divine civilization, this complex. It was the most important thing I could do in my life. And 30 years ago, when I thought about you know, the year 2000 and the fact that these buildings have to be completed by that time. Uh, I wondered if I would be alive to see that day. And here, I'm standing here talking to you when the buildings are completed. I, uh, as a Baha'i, I think, you know, you are brought up and you have some ideas. There are lots of texts and verses that you can refer. To me, uh, perhaps I can present one sentence from the words of Baha'u'llah that it happens to be in pure Persian. He revealed this tablet, uh, I think, deliberately, without using much Arabic words in it. So it is a very beautiful piece of literature. And I think uh, I have to read to you. To me, this somehow encapsulates his teachings. And uh, this sentence, I will read it in Persian first, or maybe in English first, so that I, you know what, how does it sound in Persian, and then in Persian. He says, I am the son of wisdom and the ocean of knowledge. I cheer the faint and revive the dead. <clears throat> I am the guiding light that illuminates the way. I am the royal falcon on the arm of the Almighty. I unfold the drooping wings of every broken bird and start it on its flight. 
Then it, he says, the incomparable friend saith, the portals to freedom are wide open. Hasten ye thereunto. The fountain of wisdom is flowing abundantly. Drink your fill therefrom. And then comes to this great sentence that we used to learn in Baha'i classes when we were children. Say, O beloved ones, the tabernacle of unity hath been raised. Regard ye not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. To me, this tablet and what I read to you encapsulates his teachings. زبان خرد می گوید هر که دارای من نباشد دارای هیچ نه از هرچه هست بگذرید و مرا بیابید منم آفتاب بینش و دریای دانش پژمردگان را تازه نمایم و مردگان را زنده کنم منم آن روشنایی که راه دیده بنمایم و منم شاهباز دست بینیاز که پربستگان را بگشایم و پرواز بیاموزم دوست یکتا می فرماید راه آزادی باز شده بشتابید و چشمه دانایی جوشیده از او بیاشامید بگو ای دوستان سراپرده یگانگی بلند شد به چشم بیگانگان یک دیگر را مبینید همه بار یک دارید و برگ یک شاخصار Now starting from this point of view I regard this project as Mr. Banani said as a different task It was not an ordinary architectural project that I would do. It was something that all my beliefs and the depth of my heart and love was connected with it. And we thought that these buildings are going to be the source of this freedom and the source of promoting what Baha'u'llah has said in these words. Now, Through the, our work, me and my team, my Baha'i colleagues, we have always had it, this idea in front of us. This was what the buildings were going to do. And this was always you, the point of inspiration for all, all of us. Now, starting from there, I uh, have to say you that phys to to bring to you that physically, when I arrived to Haifa, the House of Justice, they gave me a very brief program that in fact, it, uh, it was, I think, uh, another revered architect has somehow consulted with the House before, and they had some ideas about what is needed. And, uh, Those days, uh, this program was very, very brief. I remember, and I hope I'm right with my memory, that it was just a meeting room and about nine rooms for the members of the house and some uh, space for a reception. And that, what I remember, that was just this, that that architect had somehow sketched some Uh, programming bubble diagrams for it. And he had some thing like secretariat beside the building. This is Mr. McLaughlin, Robert McLaughlin, who was working in Haifa for, as a volunteer for a while, helping the house with the issues of city planning of Haifa and other things connected with the Baha'i properties. Uh, he, in the meantime, had uh, uh, discussed matters with the house. So I arrived, 
And, but the house did not tell me anything. They just said, this is something that you may want to consider. And uh, they gave me the texts regarding the importance of this building and what Baha'u'llah and um, Abdul Baha and the Guardian had envisaged about the complex. And uh, of course, the garden was there. As you know, the Guardian had done a beautiful garden at the bank of Mount Carmel, and he had built the first building uh, uh, on the garden, uh, which uh, you may want to know that this is the garden that we, uh, we call the Ark Garden. And uh, uh, the first building was the archives building. Now, th this building to me uh, is a very beautiful building. And to me, it's a jewel. And, uh, but I want to, you know, I've started with the words of Baha'u'llah. He refers to freedom of thought in, in this writing. <clears throat> uh, I want to share some of my personal thoughts with, uh, with you about this. Uh, when the house gave me this program uh, and I started to design, think of some concepts, uh, I think I had some barriers in my mind. Uh, sometimes the freedom is not, because they, the house gave me total freedom. They didn't say if I should do classic architecture or should do a contemporary building. They didn't say anything. They just say what you think is right. and. Uh, of course, the Guardian had mentioned in the writings that it should be in harmonizing style, all the buildings after the archives building. But to me, I could do a contemporary building harmonizing with the archives building. Uh, it is quite possible. Uh, and in fact, because of my uh, education, architectural education in the school, to me, doing a classic building at the you know, 20th century didn't seem right. I remember when I was a student, the archives building was finished. And some of my Baha'i colleagues in the school, they used to tell me, you know, why did they do it in classic architecture? And why didn't they give it to Corbusier to design and Frank Lloyd Wright to do it? And so I, uh, I, uh, this was when I was being trained as an architect. And we, we thought we should not do that. So this barrier was in my mind. Uh, the first sketches which came to my mind was nothing like having a classic touch. Although uh, I had done buildings before in my own country, and in my buildings, because of my belief that architecture and culture is like a tree that has its roots to the past, and it gives new fruits through new crafts, uh, new grafts, uh, grafts you do to the, to the tree, you get a new flower out of it. But the root is always there. This was my belief, and Iran, as Mr. Banani said, has a very rich architectural background. So when I was doing my buildings there, I could not ignore that uh, wealth of heritage. And uh, I had designed a few buildings referring to the essence of what I could take from the historic background of my own country. Now here I am, I, for example, this building has a lot of references to the, to the classic architecture of Iran. And this building, uh, excuse me, and the same, even the pattern on the plaza is something from the uh, classic domes of the mosques in Iran. Or this building, which is a heritage center, again, uses the, uh, the historic uh, forms and geometry. And this embassy in Beijing also, it, with its big high and a van or the covered porch in front and the geometry it has, it takes a lot from that heritage. Now, I had arrived to uh, 
the house uh, for designing of the house. And I am on Mediterranean. I know that classic architecture was born on the shores of Mediterranean in Greece. And I know that uh, this wealth of architecture has been beautiful eternally from the past, and this beauty is still there. But because of my uh, some a barrier that has been created at the time when I was a student, and because of what I heard, that you have to do a contemporary design and everything. Now I am caught for about nine months <laughs> into what I should do. And those days, Mr. Sahba, who afterwards uh, 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 took the great task of uh, managing the pr uh, construction of the two last art buildings uh, with a great care. And he is in the audience now. And this is a chance for me to thank him for what he did. Uh, Mr. Sapo was helping me in those days. And uh, so we were caught into this uh, kind of just because I had an internal barrier. I want to say freedom is not always something that comes out from uh, to limiting. It is not from outside. Here, the House of Justice, as an owner or a client, has given me total freedom. It is myself who is stopping the flow. And uh, I think it was important that one should clean himself totally from every free conception, prejudice, everything. It's, it's just like the life, I think, as a Baha'i. You have to have a very, very clean heart, as uh, Lasse was saying last night. You have to uh, have a very transparent spirit, no barriers on the way, so that the light will shine. And I think this will apply in the life of the Baha'i community too. We, this freedom is there, and the Baha'is think that they will bring this freedom to the whole world. They will free the souls of the whole community of people in the whole world. Then, through that freedom and the non-restricted kind of souls that they will see in the world, those new inspirations will come to the world and a new civilization of art and culture and literature will come to the world like it happened in the Christian civilization, in Islamic civilization. Now this is going to be seen afterwards. I don't know what it would look like. But I think it is through this freedom that the manifestation of God brings to the hearts of people, that these reflections of the light of God appears as the cultures in the world, what we have seen and we will see. That is why I think this sentence that Baha'u'llah said about portals of freedom and the fountain of, uh, this was the beautiful uh, verses that he says, that is where it comes from, I, I think. And this, for a little example of this humble self, th this happened to me. I think it, there are lots of barriers that one has, and we may have in between ourselves, we have to be free of those barriers. Now, when I came to the house, I brought two designs, one contemporary, one classic. Because, you know, the inside and the way the building functions was pretty clear to me. And this function could be covered with a modern look, it could be covered with the theme of classic architecture. The function inside would not change. Because we have now the possibility of, that's what we did, that the structural engineering allows us to have very big spans, and we don't have to put hundreds of columns as they used to have in classic buildings and clutter the spaces with columns. Uh, we can bring light easier to the buildings. We can have 
we have a lot of possibilities that they didn't have in those times. So we bring those possibilities in our design. However, the, out, the, the clothes that this building is wearing uh, can be a modern cloth or, or outfit, or can be an old uh, kind of something that gets a touch of old uh, uh, type of customs or clothing. And here, you can decide what you want. You can quote in a prose you are writing from Shakespeare. If you quote something from him to bring your ideas clearer to the audience, you will go ahead and do that. And this is a classic text. You can quote from Virgil or anybody uh, just to bring your concept in. Here is just like that. You have a prose you are writing, and you quote from classic architecture. And I did not know that. I was not limiting anything by going to classic architecture, except harmonizing with the archives. Now, the, afterwards, when I brought the design, and I remember, uh, sorry, the, uh, then I found out in the course of design about the beauties of the uh, details of the classic architecture, like what we had in a capital of a Corinthian column or the beautiful colonnades that it presents to you. is a, is a wealth of uh, uh, assets that one can uh, get to. And, uh, and the same inside. Of course, the inside of the buildings are very much uh, uh, inspired, I think, with principles of Persian architecture, principles of sequence of space, small space, large space, uh, high, low, uh, like a rhythm of music or like a poetry. The, these are different proportion spaces put together to make your travel or journey in the building exciting and pleasant. Now, the, here, for example, the dome of the council chamber of the House of Justice is one of those. It's as if the core of this building, the outer part of it, is, is a Western design, but the core of it is an Eastern design. Now, I bring this because I just wanted to make sure I don't forget the fact that Khanum, Ruhe Khanum, uh, which uh, now I was honored to design her resting place, uh, is, uh, was a great force in reinforcing these ideas and encouraging all the time. When I brought the first two designs, I think the House of Justice, uh, they consulted with uh, beloved Amatul Baha Ruhi Khanum, and uh, uh, it was in that meeting that she uh, was very encouraging to me, and uh, she told me that this is what the Guardian wanted. Because, and it was from that point that I, I knew I am on the right path uh, with the design of the seat and afterwards with the rest of the buildings. The center of study of the text uh, and the International Teaching Center, where the other bu next buildings that uh, I came about to design. And uh, there were complex problems with their design because I, uh, we didn't want to fill the whole beautiful garden with a lot of building. We wanted to keep the beauty of the garden. So that is why the building is somehow sunken into the mountain. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it has uh, somehow, it doesn't show itself very much. It, it, only the central part uh, is, is what you see, and the rest of it uh, is hidden in the garden feature. Uh, but the natural light gets to this uh, building very easily. I will show you how. Uh, but uh, people ask me how you come to these ideas. I just wanted to share with you that I uh, usually, uh, when I think of some design, I come out with a lot of sketches. This is one of them, the, one of the first ones I have done uh, 
for the sit, uh, for the center for study of the text. Uh, I will show you these sketches. Uh, I usually, uh, uh, for example, you can see the entrance uh, courtyard uh, or the portal of this building, which is a round entrance portal in this one. And this uh, shows more. I have cut the columns just to see what. This is the very first sketch I did. And uh, I usually have the uh, habit of throwing my ideas with a lot of people. I talk with, I, I respect the non-architect people ideas very much. I talk to them and see what is their reaction to what I do. It is very important to me. The layman idea, something which is untrained mind. To me, it's pure reaction that comes to me, and it feeds back. It is very, I, and it's a kind of process of consultation. I talk to a lot of people. I talk to architect friends too. Many by architects, some of them are in the audience now. They have been with me, or they come to the office, and I talk to them about what I'm doing. And uh, they come out with some ideas, but they know, just like Baha'i consultation, that what they say, I should not really follow. And I know what they, what they will say, uh, as much as I want to, to use or inspired by, I will. Otherwise, they go away from the consultation table. It is very much like that. So uh, these uh, sketches usually uh, is what starts the whole thing and ends up with this portal, which is again a Persian feature. Because of the extreme heat in Iran, you have very big uh, porches or canopies in front of the entrance of the building, sometimes very high and deep. And this uh, gives a very intimate, inviting, and compassionate look to the buildings. Because it wants, it's like it has opened its arm to invite you in. And all of these buildings, it ha they have this feature. They have a big, deep portal in front of them. The House of Just ha Justice has, the seat of the Universal House of Justice has one of them. This one has, and you see the other one. They all tell you, come in. You are, you are invited. And I think this is a very important feature. The building is not repelling. And of course, having this portal gives a very interesting, I think the center of study of the text uh, has interesting views towards the rest of the complex and towards the ocean. And of course, interesting details. If it was the old times, uh, they, we had to have another column uh, along, uh, along these areas. Uh, around this area, because it could not stand without another column. Now we are in 20th or 21st century, we have, uh, we can't do it without columns. That's why it's such an open space. So we are addressing the constraints of our time and the uh, opportunities of our time. It's, it's like a progressive revelation. You have the essence of uh, what to create beauty, to create functionality, to create a soul for the buildings. This is in your mind. Now the tools there changes in course of time. And you should be free again and open to apply these assets or new possibilities to your design and always stay at the leading edge of what you are doing without repeating what the old thing is. However, Always considering that you are coming, you are a part of that tree, which has its root in the history. Now, uh, again, the question of functionality. I should have light for these buildings. So you can see how these openings and courtyards sometimes adorned by water, which again is a very important feature in Persian architecture. Uh, happens in the center of this courtyard. And this courtyard is the, uh, uh, source of light for this library all around it, which is the reference library of center of study of the text. And uh, again, uh, the library 
just for you to see the views. This is the view of the library through that sunken courtyard. And uh, this is a view of the roof of the center of study of the text, which uh, shows the future gardens that these are ready to, to, uh, for the gardens to be planted on them. You see how it blends into the rest of the gardens. And uh, you will see the, sorry, uh, the, uh, the light wells, this is one of them, and uh, another one here, another one here, another one here. You see, these are taking light inside the heart of the building from the top. Now, this is one of those courtyards, see, looking from the top down. Another view looking from the top down. And you see this window here? Uh, yes, this is the window here, this one. And uh, right, this is the way the light comes to that four stories low, lower down. So you have natural light for all the rooms. In, this is another one of those meeting rooms. Now, uh, the buildings are mostly sunken or hidden under the garden. The, uh, I don't know if you see my mouse. Yes. Uh, this, this area is a parking which is shared between center of study of the text and another building which we call archives extension. Uh, you see this is about nine stories, this building. All parking and uh, plant room for air conditioning, etc. And uh, here is what a building under the same slope uh, is, is the archives extension. It's a building, as you see, uh, has about three stories. It is under the slope of the garden, and it has some areas uh, for light. As you see, this is another one, but there is a wall in front of it because I, don't want to, I didn't want to see the windows from the garden of the ark. Uh, I want garden to dominate all the time. So you can see the uh, planting that are going to grow and cover these walls very soon, hopefully. Uh, and the entrance, again, this is too much of a wall. It's going to be covered with green. But you can see the entrance to archives extension. Now, this building is uh, uh, connected through this tunnel uh, here. I don't know if the drawing is. This is the archives building here and it's connected from underground to archives extension, which has a vault in it. Uh, uh, this is the view of the inside of this and the vault. Now, this is where they keep all the tablets and it is a controlled uh, environment. That means humidity, uh, temperature, light, everything is controlled so that the uh, main documents, uh, the tablets and the uh, letters written by the main features of the Baha'i Faith are kept here as long as possible. And you can see my two colleagues, Mr. Farzin Yadigari and Mr. Farzin Farzad Ferdosi uh, here. These two uh, young architects, uh, they helped me now, I think it's about 30 years. They have been through all these projects with me. And these buildings have the state-of-the-art mechanical, air conditioning, all these fiber optics, everything which you can think of. That means uh, they are using the state-of-the-art technology. But the outside of them, in the House of Justice, more, it is very classic. And uh, in the other ones, again, but more free. Uh, I think uh, one of the other barriers was when I was designing the house, I was very, very careful not to step out of uh, uh, architectural, uh, classic architectural rules. Uh, you know that every column should be a distance from another column and the proportions and everything. And I went according to Vignola, the great uh, uh, Roman uh, architect uh, who has some formulas to do that. Uh, but uh, when it came to this, uh, to other two buildings, uh, perhaps I felt more free. And I felt, 
uh, more confidence, perhaps. And um, this, um, you know, I've changed all the uh, rules. Uh, the rules are what I felt is right. I haven't, I haven't uh, somehow adhered strictly to Vignola. Uh, that means I use a column, uh, for example, in front here, but the distance of columns changes. This one is smaller uh, than this one, this is smaller than this one, and the center one is the biggest. So there is a kind of progression in the columns. This is something unprecedented in classic architecture. Nobody has done it. But you feel free to do it because you are more free, I think. This is very important. And uh, the setting of the building in the arc, and uh, the columns again. Uh, it is a beauty that I think Sometimes when the architecture goes to some other areas in future years, uh, you, we may find something as beautiful as classic architecture. But really, the details, to me, they are divine. And I didn't know that. I just div I, I gradually find out when <laughs> the building was done. I said, oh, there is. it's as if you read a verse from Hafez. And if you read it 100 times, the ghazal or this poetry of Hafez, the more you read, the more you find meanings in it. And classic architecture is very much like that. The more you delve into it, the more there is to find out about. And I was very, I mean, blessed uh, was that. It was a great bounty granted to me by the House of Justice to be involved in these buildings and experience this, you know. Um, now, this building of the seat, uh, like the other buildings, this is another belief of mine, that buildings have, uh, they should have a face, you know. That means when I say uh, the center of the study of the text, you should remember how it looked. It's like a distinct person that you have met sometimes. He has a very impressive look. You never forget it. Now, all the buildings, you see the House of Justice, it is, you remember that dome over it. When I say center of study of text is that round portico in front of it. You never forget that if you have seen it. And uh, if I talk the International Teaching Center, which is this building, you always remember that it has this, again, portico in front in this shape, and it has this vault at the top. And you see how transparent it is. You can see through this, uh, this vault. Uh, to me, uh, it, it has a, I, I, uh, I do not do a lot of symbolism in the buildings, but this one, because this building is facing the shrine of the Bab, uh, it just happens to be that way. Uh, and I always were aware of that, that as if the light of the shrine is going through this building. And to me, this was like a kind of bridge over that light. And uh, I wanted to be the whole building to be very transparent, and this has uh, affected the design very much. Uh, you can see uh, the building, here is another light well, or a, a kind of court that gives the light to lower levels. And you see, uh, you know, the other side of this arch, uh, of this vault is the shrine. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture to see them all. But, uh, for example, at the center of the building, I have a very big window, again, to that, because of that reason. I, I open the back so the light goes through. Um, and again, classic architecture. I don't think I, this could be done. Uh, you know, I don't know. There, there is a formula when you fall into it, it gives you a lot. It's, it's as if you find a way of poetry and whatever you fit in, it, it just comes out nice. But you can make a mess too. You have to be very careful. <laughs> you, know, you can easily make an ugly classic building that there are these imposing fascist buildings all over the world. They are classic too. <laughs> so. But you know these details, I mean, it takes centuries to come out with these details. It's a pity to leave them, I think. Uh, it is amazing to me. As I said, I think it's a divine inspiration, this thing. Uh, they, uh, some people believe it was an inspiration to Solomon, but I don't know. 
uh, the classic architecture, I mean. Uh, again, the seat, uh, the center of study, uh, the international teaching center. There are features in the building. For example, this is, you know, we follow the American codes and uh, uh, safety codes. UBC is what we followed for my colleagues. And uh, you have to have two exits, you have to have two uh, staircases within that distance in the building, everything. We have strictly adhered to those. And uh, so here we had to have exit staircases. In the meantime, the main staircase of the building. So this is one of them. I just wanted to show you that it sits in a kind of squarish box, but it is, has a very free flow. And uh, another view and another view when it comes to the main entrance hall. And uh, this uh, feature again refers to Persian geometry. Uh, to me, uh, uh, it takes the light to main entrance atrium of the teaching center. And uh, Again, uh, you, you, you can see this prism here, a, a glass piece here. This is another reference, because this is right at the center of the building, under this sunburst, I, I call it, uh, sunburst pattern. And uh, again, it is uh, referring to the light coming from the shrine, from the center of the window at the other side of this prism in the room, uh, which is the meeting room of the main meeting room of this uh, uh, teaching center. This is the courtyard above, which has a skylight that you don't see. It's hidden between the gardens here in this area and takes the light to that sunburst. And again, that transparency that I talked about. This is uh, the library, of course, a reference library for the International Teaching Center. And some marble details. We have uh, given uh, utmost attention to detail to these buildings because they had to stay there for 500 years as the house had part of the program. So everything had to be perfect as much as we could. You can see some of these details of wood and marble, solid marble. Again, again, you can see the, the dome of the shrine through this window, what I was talking about here. And this is a view of the library inside this vault at the top of the teaching center and another view of the librarian table and other shelves on the lower level of the library. And again, that uh, prism that uh, takes the light, it faces that shrine again. It, it's as if it is capturing all the energies of the shrine of the Bab under the burst of this sunburst, which to me, uh, again, uh, Uh, I, I should bring it afterwards to you, but these are some other sunken courtyards that gives light to the basement level of this building. And a meeting room in that building, in teaching center. And a, a drawing to show nine levels that only three of them being this blue part at the top. This is what you see outside. The rest of this building is all sunken in the ground and includes a lot of features, like this is the entry hall of that auditorium, which we call it the common area. There are lots of uh, facilities under this building, which is entirely a separate complex. The teaching center sits over that common area. This is the entrance kind of information desk, the uh, cafeteria, and uh, it's serving part, the foyer or the lobby of the, uh, the auditorium which seats about 400 people, 
Uh, you see it's completely out of those old uh, classic uh, modes because we are now underground and inside and we do what, is, what can be done today. The, again, some views of the inner part of the foyer and the, the, uh, the left-hand side, the dining room in this area. This is dining room, this is the foyer or the lobby of the auditorium connected together. And this uh, dining room can act as an extension to auditorium with the video screens repeating the uh, program inside. And some other views, again. And the auditorium, all under the International Teaching Center. As you see, this auditorium has about five different levels. And it has all the facilities of translators, projection room, video, everything. A very deep stage, a backstage for uh, um, performances and uh, any other use they want to make out of it. Again, some uh, views of uh, inside of the meeting rooms. I think the slide is not very good, but uh, he, you should be able to see the shrine here again, the dome of the shrine, through this central window of the building. And opposite to that window is again that sunburst, which uh, to me, as I said, I do not uh, think, I do not follow much of the symbolic figures and numbers and number nine and 19 and things in the buildings. I don't uh, uh, consider uh, this necessary. Or if it comes to me, I will. Otherwise, I don't restrict myself to bring all this uh, uh, kind of s figure uh, symbolism to the buildings. I think it's more important for the building to be beautiful and uh, to work uh, than uh, having, although, for example, this sunburst here has nine sides, nine, nine rays, but it is the most I can go. Uh, I do not, uh, I see they build Baha'i buildings and uh, Baha'i centers and everybody wants to have a hall of nine-sided hall, which is wrong. I mean, uh, you don't do that. For a temple, yes, because it is uh, one place of gathering has one use of worship and nothing else. And uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha wanted it to look as if it invites everybody inside from nine doors and everything. Yes, the Baha'i temples is a principle we follow and it unifies and designates what is a Baha'i temple. But you know, you, we don't do Baha'i centers all the time, nine-sided. It is not a practical form. Uh, and uh, also, we don't do it classic because it's not the place for it. I did the classic because I followed what the Guardian had said. I had to harmonize with the garden and what was sitting there. And uh, there was a type of building to stay there for 500 years. It is different to do a Baha'i center and start to do it in classic modes and things in, in the middle of an American city. You know, it is different. It, you have to think that our, the complex of art was in a very serene environment. You cannot do the, the classic architecture has a lot of detail which needs meditation. It needs you pause and look at it. It is not something that you drive 60 kilometers an hour in a main road in London, you know. It, it used to be good in Regent Street when they used to go by horses beside it. Now you drive so fast and you don't see anything. It just collects dust and it's difficult to upkeep. Now, but in the art garden, it is the most appropriate place. You have come to meditate. You have come with the idea of reverence. You have come to think of what you are, where we are, are going. And the gardens are so beautiful that asks for this detail. It asks for this meditating mode to look at each of these details. That is the difference. That is why this architecture cannot be applied everywhere. I mean, you, you don't do that. 
It is only for this specific location that this solution has been suggested. Now, uh, the Sunburst here happens to have nine sides, and uh, uh, the prism that sticks out of the wall of the main meeting room of the, uh, of the uh, center of uh, international teaching center, or we call it center of international counselors, that's another name we gave to it, uh, when we were doing our drawings. Uh, this prism holds the greatest name. And beside it, unfortunately, I couldn't capture it with my photography. And in fact, it's not very easy to read it, but it is on the side of this piece of glass all along this area in Persian calligraphy. Something is engraved in this prism. And this, what it has been engraved there, uh, at, at, the, at this edge of this side is what I read to you, which, in which I, I want to again say this and finish it. I am the son of wisdom and the ocean of knowledge. I cheer the faint and revive the dead. I am the guiding light that illuminates the way. I am the royal falcon on the arm of the Almighty. I unfold the drooping wings of every broken bed and start it in its flight. Thank you. <laughs>